Welcome to On The Go with AAUW. I'm your host, Diane Hennessy King, and we have a terrific story for you today about a woman you probably have never even heard of, abolitionist Julia Wilbur. And I think nowadays because of films and books like Hidden Figures, we've become aware of just how many untold stories there are about unsung women. And today we have author Paula Tarnapol Whitaker with us to tell us a little bit more about Julia Wilbur. And Paula has been determined to tell the world about Julia. So who was she and how did you come to uncover her story? Well, she was, like you said, an unsung hero. She was born in 1815, started life in a traditional way of working as a teacher in Rochester, New York, but because of the Civil War, ended up doing work to try to help people escaping slavery in Alexandria and Washington. And she was this amazing woman who started out, as, as you said, she was in Rochester, and I know you're gonna uh, tell us a little bit more about the background. Um, and when she went to Washington. She was a 47-year-old woman, no influence, no money, no, you know, not someone who had been seen as a great leader or, or anything like that, and really remade her life. And I know your subtitle of your book, A Civil Life in an Uncivil Time, is uh, Julia Wilbur's Struggle for Purpose, and I think that's as much the story as well. Right. Um, but going back to Rochester, it was not a sleepy town. It was a progressive spot, right? Right. It was a hotbed of social reform at the time. The Erie Canal you know, had gone through about 20 years uh, before this period. Mm -hmm. So that by the 1840s, there was abolition, there was women's rights, there was temperance. And Julia Wilbur was a teacher at the time. She was about 29 years old and through mm -hmm. her 30s and became involved in all of that and started becoming exposed to these new ideas Frederick Douglass was there, Susan B. Anthony, so um, this was kind of the world that she was a part of. Right. And uh, Frederick Douglass, I know, um, came to lecture in Rochester like in the 40s. Right. I mean, really early when we think of when we're connecting it with the Civil War. And also ran his newspaper, or published his newspaper, North Star, out of Rochester. Right. And, uh, I know they were colleagues off and on. They were not close friends, but they were certainly colleagues. And as you said, Susan B. Anthony. So some of these movements um, that she became involved with really were ones that gave women a role they hadn't had before, such as the temperance that kind of got things started, right? people getting together. Right, because certainly at the time, women were expected to be inside their sphere. That was the term that was used, and that sphere was in the household. Mm -hmm. She was a little bit different because she was single, and that gave her actually a certain more latitude than married women at the time, mm -hmm. legally, in terms of what she could, you know, how she could spend her time. Um, so she was, you know, going to meetings and kind of being becoming involved in all of this. Mm -hmm. um, but still, it was, you know, she was often criticized for going mm -hmm. going too far outside her sphere. Right, right. Basically, she, her whole life she was criticized for that. Right. But she still did it. And because she was supposed to be home, taking care of her family, her, her extended family, right. her which sister's she, which children, she also, and she right, did. Right. And she, mm -hmm. and uh, that was always uh, uh, certainly a pull, right, uh, uh, and attention, but. Uh, and, and New York itself, I mean, they, they uh, the state abolished slavery in 1827, right. which was, Fairly late. you know, <laughs> uh, uh, so there was this uh, abolitionist movement and she was raised a Quaker, right? Uh, right. And mm -hmm. it's part of it. But the, um, I think she found when she got to Alexandria and Washington, it, 
the, the reality was you know different than what she had been thinking of up right. in Rochester. Right. Uh -huh. um, in Rochester, she had been involved with a group called the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. Mm -hmm. They raised money um, before the war, and then when the war began, they decided to fund somebody to come down to a uh, Union-occupied area, to mm -hmm. come to Washington to see what could be done to help people escaping slavery. Um, if they got across Union lines after 1861, mm -hmm they would not be you know, returned back south or to their, quote, masters. Mm -hmm. So um, this was the kind of the theory back mm -hmm. up north. When she came south to actually do it, she came um, not sure exactly how she was going to mm -hmm. be helping, but you know, sort of armed with some letters of introduction and sort of high hopes. And then when she got to this area, um, it was a pretty different story. I mean, mm -hmm. there was, you know, there was sort of chaos and confusion and poverty and um, officialdom that was not mm -hmm. necessarily welcoming of you know, the task that they had, which was to try to uh, protect people escaping slavery or freedmen, as what they're, what they're called. Mm -hmm. um, so she had to sort of find a place in all of that. Mm -hmm. And figuring out where her place was and how she could make a difference was, um, you know, took some doing, but mm -hmm. she managed to do that. She was um, from 1862 to 1865 working in Alexandria. And then she moved to Washington and did you know, similar work. Right. Mm -hmm. And we know all of this because of the diaries. Right. So do you want to tell people what these diaries were like? I know there are two different kinds. Uh, she wrote diaries for over 50 years. Right. And reading your book, um, and I'm, I'm just going to hold this up right now, you feel as if you are walking the streets with her. Uh, and part of it is because the, she is a vivid writer. Right. And b part of it is because you did such a terrific job of putting this together. And we want to say early on, this is all true. The, this <laughs> this book is not made up history, uh, but tell us about those diaries. Right. Well, thanks to the diaries, which were in her family until about 1980, when one of her great great nephews, who was a professor at Haverford College outside Philadelphia, donated them to the college. Mm -hmm. So they are in the public, mm -hmm. you know. Or what a wonderful gift! Right. It I was. Mean, you wish everybody would scour right. their right. attic. Right. You know, and so because of that, that is how we know her story. Mm -hmm. She did, um, or at least the, the diaries we have begin in 1844 when she's just starting to teach, and they mm -hmm. go through the rest of her life. She died in 1890. And um, they are just a very vivid, um, you know, uh, not only descriptions of heroic, you know, and historic moments that mm -hmm. she witnesses, but her own thoughts, her own dreams, mm -hmm. her ups, her downs. I mean, mm -hmm. a very human person, um, not always, um, you know, seeing the good things in mm -hmm. life, often seeing the bad, just like mm -hmm. all of us do when we mm -hmm. pour into our diaries. So through that, we're able to really get a glimpse mm -hmm. of um, this time and this woman's experiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the diaries were you know, the small ones, the sort of commercially made ones, and then also written sheets of paper. Right. I had first got involved in the project by um, offering through Alexandria Archaeology to mm -hmm. transcribe these small pocket diaries. Um, and uh, there were uh, you know, they were on microfilm when I first started mm -hmm. the project. So I did that for a couple of years and then I had not seen the originals yet. Mm -hmm. I decided to go up to Haverford to see the originals. When I did, I discovered that not only were there these pocket diaries, but there was this whole other set of diaries mm -hmm. that you were just talking about. And these were just, they were sort of parallel. They kind of gave her a chance to kind of wax on a little bit more mm -hmm. when she wanted to. Um, and. Uh, and they, uh, you know, kind of tell sometimes a fuller story. Mm -hmm. What I did with those was I was not really <laughs> up for transcribing. I think I probably would still be transcribing right now. Oh my gosh, but yes. um, through Friends of Alexandria Archaeology, which mm -hmm. is a nonprofit group uh, in the city, um, I kind of crowdsourced transcribing. Mm -hmm. e volunteers each took 75 pages mm -hmm. or often more, um, and they transcribed. We, you know, we shared them to proofread them. So mm -hmm. the goal was to get them, get kind of the civil war years of her life, we did mm -hmm. from about 1860 to 1866, um, transcribed, 
online and searchable, and so they are available mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. um, you know for that purpose through Alexandria Archaeology. Um, in the meantime, as I did it, of course, mm -hmm. I started getting more and you know curious about where she came from, mm -hmm. what she did afterwards, you know, the context when she mentioned something, mm -hmm. what else was going on. And so from there I went from kind of a diary transcription project to this book. Mm -hmm. Well, it has to be, I mean, I know it, it's such a different style of writing than, than uh, probably some of the writing you have done. And I know you're a writer and editor and are writing and have worked with uh, National Institute of Health and National Academy of Sciences and other groups. Uh, but when I was thinking about it, it really in many respects, even though this is a narrative story, I think that it is an example of your strengths in the sense that the work that you have done before is all fact-based. And this book, uh, is so factual. I mean, it, it's it's filled with facts that uh, I think will be surprises to people. Mm -hmm. There are a lot. There's so many events in there that uh, you think, oh yes, I know about Lincoln's assassination, or I know about uh, Fort Sumter, or whatever that. And then you read this book, and you find out all kinds of other things that were going on at the same time. Uh, but you know, you really do have a very uh, non-fictional background, and the uh, and your you know your bachelor and masters from Johns Hopkins. Uh, it, it, it's so well written, and it's using also the source of somebody who wrote so well. Uh, thank you. Yep. It's really a lovely combination. Oh, of, thank and, you. Uh, uh, and as you said, we know what she was thinking. You know her emotions. Uh, she has a section in there on uh, when she was still in Rochester, taking on the pay gap between men and women teachers, right? And that uh, she put a petition in. It didn't get anywhere, but uh, she has a very nice way of saying that there is no reason that men should be paid more than women if they're doing the same job. And you think, okay, this was in the 1857 or right, something like exactly. that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so it's great. It's it's her words, and it's her observation, and it's, and it's your putting it together. But going to the Civil War, um, you actually begin this whole book with the prologue that touches on um, Abraham Lincoln's assassination, and the chapter is or the prologue in, in the chapter of her saying that uh, April 15th, the day after, right. uh, that the saddest sound she ever heard were the bells right. tolling right. for uh, him. Uh, and you get her direct, immediate responses as well as the people around her. And it's just... Right, that was a very powerful moment mm -hmm. for the country and being able to see it through one person's eyes was really a gift, right. I think. And she brings out um, so many things that you don't tend to hear about of the, uh, that when she, we have a picture of, we think, of her there, she and Harriet Jacobs and Harriet Jacobs' daughter being in a photo of the celebration of toward the end of the war. Right. Uh, uh, in front of a building, and it was that celebration, then it was that night that uh, 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 Lincoln was shot. But the, her saying that when she went from Alexandria back to Washington that, that treason was in the air, she felt like treason was in the air, and when she was in Alexandria that the Union soldiers we're going house to house and making sure that uh, black banners were right. being shown for respect kind of thing. And, right. You know, it's, it's just such vivid pictures. Right. Uh, she, yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, there were people who, you know, were not, were realized it better not be like jubilant in public, but there were certainly people who felt that, you know, though he got his, 
Um, but then there were mm -hmm. also, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who mm -hmm. were, you know, in true grief and mourning, mm -hmm. and she was right there with them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, yeah, so it was really kind of a very, you know, sort of huge time for, um, you know, to be living through. Right. Particularly after, as you said, the joy of, oh, you know, the, the country's going to be a better place. Mm -hmm. We got mm -hmm. through this. Mm -hmm. You know, now what? Mm -hmm. You know, to go from that right. to... Right, Appomattox yeah. was over right. and the, uh, all that. Right. So, but let's go to what she did during the Civil mm -hmm. War. Sure. I mean, she, uh, you know, helped with health care. She helped with housing. She, and, and if you'd explain the... Uh, the freedmen right. and the contraband, because right. we keep hearing those names. And right. It was a very different view of. Right. Um, so, uh, again, once the um, uh, beginning in 1861, when people who were enslaved went across Union lines, the Union Army would not return them back to the South. And the argument was, I mean, it's sort of. Um, uh, not a pleasant way to no, describe people, no, but right, because right. they were quote property, they did not have to return to the South because you know they were it would be like contraband of mm -hmm, war. Mm -hmm. So the term contraband ended up becoming sort of part of the parlance in the newspapers, what have you. Um, quite rightly, people started saying, "Well, I'm not a piece of property. I'm right. a person. Thank you very right. much." Um, and uh, they became known as freedmen. Mm -hmm. Freed, and they were men, women, and children, mm -hmm. by the way. Alexandria had um, about seven thousand and people come in um, nationwide probably as many as half a million 500,000 mm -hmm. um, these are people who had to make like a split second decision to leave mm -hmm. you know with basically the clothes on their back and that was about mm -hmm. it so they would come um, you know they had been enslaved their whole lives um, you know they came in ill health they mm -hmm. came you know certainly with no money or mm -hmm. anything else um, and uh, the, officially the Union Army was responsible for them um, you know, different people more or less took on the role. No, no army person really uh, embraced it, you would mm -hmm. say. I mean, mm -hmm. they were doing a lot of other things at the time, mm -hmm. and here was sort of one more responsibility. Um, but nonetheless, there were barracks that were provided mm -hmm. in Alexandria, in Washington, and some other places. Mm -hmm. um, and that I was loved it that uh, Harriet, uh, not, not Harriet Jacobs, excuse me, Julia, uh, wrote President Lincoln. Right. With it in like, what, three days yeah, or right. something after getting to say, right. we really need to move this along. Barracks. Yeah, let's yeah. move this let's along a little bit. Yeah, right. And so um, she became sort of an advocate for mm -hmm. better conditions um, in terms of housing, in terms of health. Um, one of the things that um, she had to do was uh, solicit clothing from mm -hmm. up north. She would get donations, and then um, they would, you know, to be distributed. Now, she didn't do it alone. You mm -hmm. mentioned Harriet Jacobs, and that's sort of a good segue to say that a couple months after she arrived, uh, a woman named Harriet Jacobs came to sort of do mm -hmm. a similar job. Harriet was an African-American who herself had been enslaved in North Carolina and um, kind of wrote a, uh, a narrative about her experiences. Mm -hmm. So. Um, when she came, um, the two of them, after a little bit of sort mm -hmm. of tentative kind of, you know, figuring each other out, or certainly Julia, for her part, mm -hmm. figuring out Harriet, realized that they could accomplish a lot more together mm -hmm. than either could separately. Mm -hmm. So they became kind of allies and friends. Mm -hmm. And you know, the idea that a black woman and a white woman working together um, was not, first of all, you didn't see women out, out that period. much, right. much less, you know, a black woman and a white woman mm -hmm. together. And so they cut, you know, a fairly unique uh, figure, I would mm -hmm. say, in Alexandria. Um, they would be um, going up to the military governor and the provost marshal. These were kind of the main sort of mm -hmm. army people who were, you know, kind of in charge of things. Um, there was also a civilian uh, who had the title of superintendent of contrabands, who they just saw as, you know, really kind of bullying the people he mm -hmm. was supposed to be responsible for. Right. His name was Gladwin. He's in right. the book as kind of he our is villain. Not, well, yeah, yes, we, say, we don't like him, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Um, but um, you know, having to battle mm -hmm. him. And mm -hmm. so, um, as much as it's also, you know, it's sort of a, a history. What I, and mm -hmm. as you say, I, everything is true. Yes. There's also the kind of um, ups and downs and foibles mm -hmm. of any kind of people mm -hmm. trying to get something done right. in a chaotic, stressful time. Right. And she said, you know, uh, I've heard heard you talk about her before in the sense of she wasn't connected to, you know, she just came down from Rochester with a, 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 a women's abolitionist group. The, uh, she wasn't connected with the nursing right. and she wasn't connected with teaching even though she did all this work with health and, and with education. Um, 
And she felt like she was a missionary without... Well, uh, oh, yeah, at one point when she looked back on yeah. what she did, she described herself as a missionary at large, a woman right. of all work. Yeah, right. And that was pretty, that was a good description. I thought, I thought it was an excellent right. description. Um, and you mentioned uh, Harriet Jacobs, the, a phenomenal woman uh, right. who uh, escaped from slavery in North Carolina and after hiding in a family attic for like seven years. Right. Um, and so the, the backgrounds that, uh, you know, of people that Julia met and worked with uh, were just so eye-opening. And uh, I, I think that it just reinforced even more that she knew she was doing important work. Right. And, and I, I think it's such important work that you have brought her story uh, forward and so that people can really see and, 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 and read about uh, somebody who kind of remade herself at 47 and uh, you know you talk about her struggle and it was a lifelong struggle of who are we and how right. did we get here and how can one person make a difference right. and how and she certainly, she did. Right. Uh, she was amazing. Uh, and I know in some of the, uh, uh, in some of the photos in your book, mm -hmm. you know, you, you show the house in Rochester. Right. Where, you know, where she started with. And I believe there's a, um, a view of uh, Rochester, or, or, you know, a kind of a high view of right. Rochester as a city. And you realize, you know, Rochester was bigger than Alexandria. I mean, it was, you know, it was just uh, amazingly different. Uh, and then also some of the photos in Alexandria during the uh, Civil War, and you have one of, you can describe it, of the men working, uh, African Americans right. working. Right, so um, the fear, if you will, of um, the Union Army was that people would become too dependent. And um, people didn't want to become dependent. Mm -hmm. They wanted to work. Mm -hmm. You know, they wanted to have smite, you know, make homeless for themselves and you know, try to reunite mm -hmm. with family. So um, many of the um, men became, you know, kind of laborers. This was bef this was uh, before they could actually join the um, the army, mm -hmm. the U.S. Colored mm -hmm. Troops. Mm -hmm. uh, once that happened in 1863, many did that as well. You know, enlisted. Um, but certainly they were, you know, helping to um, work on the railroad. You know, Alexandria was this huge logistics center, mm -hmm. um, there was stockades, there was you know, protection to be built, mm -hmm. and so um, there are some photographs of that. Um, women might be laundresses, mm -hmm. they might help with cleaning, they would help take care of you know, other children, things like that. Um, one, of the one of the other challenges that Julia had was that wages, either by the government or by private mm -hmm. people, um, to freedmen who were working were often you know, kind of late or mm -hmm. delayed or mm -hmm. some issue with them, and so sometimes she would be going around trying to wrest wages mm -hmm. that were due people mm -hmm. you know, to make sure that they got them. Mm -hmm. so. And it was just, I mean, it was an amazing influx of people that, uh, and that desperation to find a union occupied area that you could then become free. Right. And I know, um, I think at, you know, before the Civil War, I think uh, Rochester was actually one of the last stops on the Underground Railroad and that the, uh, but the attraction to try and get to Alexandria right. and Washington was enormous. Right. Uh, um, you know, the uh, it, Rochester was a really important uh, mm -hmm. stop on the Underground Railroad. You know, Canada was sort of a boat right, right, right away. Yeah, right. Um, but that was very difficult to get to. I mean, oh. really only just the smallest oh. percentage of people, unfortunately, right. were able to, you know, kind of go that route. Right. Um, and, um, you know, not everyone, I mean, but, you know, geography is everything. I mean, depending on where you live, depending mm -hmm. on where where, you know, if you could get to freedom and get mm -hmm. to safety. Um, but, you know, it's just sort of hard to believe how, um, you know, 
what a flux of, you know, between soldiers mm -hmm. and wounded people and freedmen and, you know, hucksters mm -hmm. and business people. I mean, things were just a very, uh, a place in a lot of flux, shall we mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, Julia had to sort of figure out, you know, you know where to live, right. I mean, where to eat. Yeah. you know, how to buy things, mm -hmm. how to send mail, how to mm -hmm. receive mail. I mean, mm -hmm. everything from like the grandiose to mm -hmm. the kind of very everyday, right. you know, were things that she had to negotiate. Right. And how Alexandria had hopefully changed somewhat in the sense that one of the photos in your book is uh, the building that had been used by slave dealers and right. the mm -hmm. caption, right. you know, the uh, reads it, Birch and... Bur uh, Price and Birch, Price and dealer Birch. and slaves, yes. Right. And uh, the Union soldiers took over that building event, but the uh, that indeed it had been a hotbed of slave trade, right. and that uh, here were all these people who were becoming free by being able to reach it right. uh, is really just yeah. amazing. I mean, she does sort of comment on the irony yes. a few times of, you know, here I yes. am in a former slave trading, you know, handing out anti-slavery tracts right, right, or, right, right, right. or whatever. After the war, right. a woman who had been enslaved was in charge of, kind of in charge yes. of the building until they figured out what to do with it. Yeah. So there was some delicious ironies yes, that yes, she, yes. you and know, you point them yeah, out, she appreciated. She them out. Right. And so there is a, actually, a, 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 there is actually a humor in this book. The, uh, and she went on into the Reconstruction era, uh, and again, you know, pacing, uh, you know, outpacing so many people in the sense that she was one of the first generation working for the federal government. She went and worked after working for the Freedmen's Bureau right after the war to the patent office. And I think you have a photo of the uh, patent office, which is everybody's going to recognize as is the Smithsonian right. uh, Art History Museum. Uh, and uh, portrait gallery, the, uh, you know, sh she changed again. And she worked until right before she died at 80 years of age. Right. Uh, and we only have about a minute left, but I want to uh, ask you, uh, in the first place, everybody can find out more about the book and more about Julia by going to your website, which is on the screen. And uh, you have a blog, you have all kinds of speaking engagements. and. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think Julia would advise us to do <laughs> now? Um, well, I think that she would say, "What can you do to make a difference?" You know, she. I call this a civil life in an uncivil time. What could she? What things could, did she feel she could do at the time? Mm -hmm. And I think she would challenge us t today mm -hmm. to say, what do we feel we could do to make a difference, to make the world a better place? Um, you know, I say it was a struggle for purpose. It was a lot of a you know, personal mm -hmm. struggle and it was kind of a, a political struggle. Right. That's what we have to deal with, you know, today as today. well. And I think you have made the world, seriously, a better place by writing this book. Oh, and thank I thank the volunteers who also helped you. So. Right. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Okay.